Hello and everybody, or hello everybody. I've started drinking the eggnog early, I guess. Anyway, it is Christmas Eve and I hope that you are spending today with your family because I know I am. I'm not even here in the studio. This is pre-recorded but should still be a lot of fun. And while you're off, you know, getting a well-deserved rest, spending time with your friends and your family, getting presents and all that. Um, we wanted to talk about some stories that we didn't necessarily have time to fit into the normal crush of news in a regular week. And so we've got a lot of stuff we're gonna be covering uh, through the course of this show. From you know, like long-term changes and people putting off health care, um, you know, how the media is covering Donald Trump, apparent some improvement apparently. We're gonna have a little bit of good news for you. Um, but what I thought would be important and, and good to do on theme for the show would be to start off with a little overview of some of the environmental news uh, that I've been noticing uh, recently. So while we're gonna cover a lot of different topics, we're gonna be starting off in true damage report fashion with an overview of some of what's going on with our environment. We talked less than two years ago now about Donald Trump imposing new tariffs on solar cells. And we hypothesized at that time, both here in studio and trade groups that were trying to push for solar energy, that that would be bad overall. For the development of solar energy for jobs in the solar industry, well, fast forward to today and we have some actual hard numbers. So let's take a look. Now bear in mind that this started off, this is a four year tariff program. Early 2018, starting at 30% and dropping by five percentage points each year. So getting less crushing each year, but starting off a 30% tariff, that is insane. And that's why we expected that it would be so bad. Well, here's how it's looking. More than 62,000 jobs and nearly $19 billion in new private sector investment has been lost due to the tariffs Trump placed on solar imports. This is according to the SEIA. The number of jobs lost is nearly double the toll first estimated when Trump announced the tariffs. Now you would think that when the monthly jobs report comes out and politicians, whether it's a Democratic president or Republican president, if the numbers are good, they love to tout it. Okay, and presidents have some effect on those numbers. Presidents have some effect on the economy at large. But when the president chooses of his own volition, to make a move like imposing 30% tariffs on a particular product. And we see now that tens of thousands of jobs have been lost due to that specific decision. You would think that that would receive a little bit of media coverage. This overall changes and you know going up and down in the jobs from month to month, that can be tied loosely to the president or to the dominant political party, but it is loose. This is not. This is his decision to do this. And what could have happened, we could be leaders internationally in the development of solar energy and pushing for more and more of our energy to be generated with clean and renewable energy. That has been hamstrung because Donald Trump decided that he likes coal better than solar. Now, this news has come out, we now know what actually happened with the solar industry, but that does not mean that the Trump administration is going to take this laying down. Peter Navarro, Trump's trade and manufacturing advisor, said the report was quote, classic fake news dressed up in academic mumbo jumbo. So clearly they are taking this seriously. They're taking those 60,000 plus jobs seriously, $19 billion in new private sector investment very seriously. And that's his trade and manufacturing advisor. This is supposed to be the area that he is expert in, that he's professional in. But instead, it's just, it's catchphrases, it's, it's a Donald Trump tweet. That's what we get from the trade and manufacturing advisor to the president. Uh, now, another consequence, let's say that you want to install solar. Let's say that you are not a regular person, but maybe you're trying to set up a, a solar field to generate energy that way. Well, it's probably relevant to you that the new report found that US prices for solar cells are among the highest in the world. And that again is a direct result of Donald Trump's choice to impose that tariff on solar cells. And what's interesting, and this, this does, I love to mention this sort of thing, it doesn't matter. But if you're a Donald Trump fan, if you're a voter in Donald Trump, maybe in a big, in a deep red state, like imagine if the president went out of his way with his tariff policy to hurt you. I mean, there's any number of different areas, the soybeans, the effect on the farmers, all of that. We keep going over it. This is another one where we see that with the tariffs having the greatest impact on newer solar markets in Alabama, the Dakotas, and Kansas. 
because they make solar uncompetitive with dirtier, more traditional forms of energy generation. So if you are a Trump voter living in one of those states, not only are you theoretically having to pay more for your energy, but also because that energy is gonna be generated through things like coal and natural gas, all of that, you're likely to get sicker too as a result of that energy production. You could have had cheaper, cleaner energy, but the president wasn't interested in what you wanted. He was interested in what the coal CEOs wanted, what oil CEOs wanted. They're doing okay. All of this bad information, all this lost private sector investment, lost jobs, that's our loss. But that is very much their gain. Okay, so from solar, let's turn now to one of the consequences of climate change. And that is, once again, we're touching base with ice loss. Specifically in Greenland, the Greenland ice sheets losses have accelerated so fast since the 1990s, it's now shedding more than seven times as much ice each year, according to 89 scientists who use satellites to study the Greenland ice sheet loss. The sheets losses have doubled each decade. And so this is again, one of those areas where when you can go on Fox News and they're saying like, oh, climate change, it's cold in New York today. Uh, no, not only were the predictions right, not only were the estimates uh, not incorrect, but in that where they were wrong, they were underestimating how fast climate change would wreak havoc with uh, areas like Greenland, Antarctica, uh, and all of that. Now this is significant, I'm gonna throw a couple of numbers your way and take a look at this, around the planet, a one centimeter sea level rise brings about six million people into seasonal annual floods. So that's one centimeter of sea level rise globally, which seems really minor, right? I mean, you can barely even see it, six million people for one centimeter. Greenland alone could contribute about 16 centimeters or around half a foot to ocean levels just until by the end of this century. So you're talking about tens of millions of people having their homes, agriculture, all of that being flooded on an annual basis just from the effect in Greenland. And theoretically, when you look at smaller glaciers around the world, when you look at the effect on Antarctica, which is even worse, we could see up to 20 feet of sea level rise over a millennium with a lot of that being stacked in the near future. I mean, you're not talking about tens of millions, you're talking about hundreds of millions or billions of people, hypothetically, that could find their areas unlivable in the near future thanks to out of control climate change that so few countries are actually taking seriously. But while we're talking about the ocean, the ice isn't the only issue that we should care about. Let's also talk about the oxygen content in the oceans. The International Union for Conservation of Nature released the largest report of its kind, finding that the oxygen level of the ocean has declined by about 2% since the 1950s, and the volume of water completely depleted of oxygen has quadrupled since the 1960s. So. This is again, and almost always when we're talking about climate change, some of these numbers might seem small, but they can be devastating. One centimeter of sea level rise is a really big deal for millions of people. 2% drop in oxygen, really big deal if you are you know, marine life that is trying to live in these areas. 60 years ago, only 45 ocean sites suffered from low oxygen levels. That number in 2011 had shot up to 700. And according to the study, about 50% of the oxygen loss in the upper part of the ocean is a result of temperature increase. So it is not just climate change, although some of the other things impacting it are themselves impacted by climate change, out of control growth of algae and things like that, that also has an impact on oxygen levels. But the biggest and the most easily influenceable if we cared to would be dealing with climate change. And this is not a small thing, this isn't you know, like, hey, isn't it interesting that this area has no oxygen? A very large percentage of the Earth's population relies on fish for their protein intake on a daily basis. And in addition to the overfishing that we've already talked about, this is how you imperil food supplies for hundreds of millions or billions of people. This sort of process, uncontained, proceeding at a time when not enough countries are taking seriously the plight of overfishing, that is a serious problem. And it's proceeding at the same time that climate change is making some areas inland unable to be exploited in terms of agriculture. And so all of these processes are pushing us to a world that cannot sustain its growing population when it comes to the need to feed them on a daily basis. Now let's turn to an expert, IUCN Acting Director General Dr. Grethel Goulart said, with this report, the scale of damage climate change is wreaking upon the ocean comes into stark focus. As the warming ocean loses oxygen, the delicate balance of marine life is thrown into disarray. 
And a combination of climate change and increased nutrient discharge will cause a three to four percent decrease in oxygen ocean levels, our ocean oxygen levels on average by 2100 if business continues as usual. Now, I understand if you've made it this far into the video that focusing on the level of oxygen in the ocean is going to seem very esoteric. But it is supposed to be a reminder, even if you're not a scientist, even if you don't spend a lot of time following the science of climate change and all of its impacts, I want you to know how all encompassing this is. That there's virtually no place on earth, no species on earth, whether animal or plant that is not being impacted by the effect we're having on our planet. And that is why when it comes to ice levels, when it comes to oxygen in the ocean, when it comes to the way we generate our energy, these are all interrelated issues. And so the way that we address them too needs to be interrelated. And also prioritized. When I was talking earlier about how I felt like we weren't focusing enough on activists like Greta Thunberg, when I talk about the the Sunrise Movement, all of that. When I talk about politicians who are right on this issue, whether it's you know people in Congress that are leading on this, like like AOC or presidential candidates like Bernie Sanders, we again we cannot wait on this. This is not a thing that you know, ah, let's get through this election or let's make sure that we have a Senate majority and then we can do something about it. It is on all of us to do whatever we can to push for solutions in this area right now. Not tomorrow, certainly not a year or 10 years from now. Because some of these things, once they've gotten done, they're not recoverable. You wanna like like recover the ice sheets of Greenland? You wanna um, increase oxygen level in the ocean? We're talking about things that once they get wrecked, it will take literally centuries or longer to fix and we can't wait. Okay, we've got a lot more planned throughout this show. We're gonna be talking about some really big picture policy areas that we haven't focused enough on recently. So stick around, we got a lot planned for you. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Not long ago, we showed you a video of Donald Trump being asked a question about climate change. And he responded saying that clean air and clean water are a very important part of climate change. He's a guy that doesn't know and isn't going to learn what the actual concerns are. But there are politicians who get it and who have gotten it for a very long time. And so I wanna show you two pieces of video from way, way back in 1991, decades before my co-host Emma was even born. Oh, man. Showing that some people not only got the threat of climate change, but understood what the solution should be. Effectively understood what the Green New Deal would be back in the early 90s. Here is Bernie Sanders back in 1991. The truth of the matter is, I think, that unless we move radically and boldly as you indicate, uh, we may lose the planet for our grandchildren. Interestingly enough, I think, and I say this not because I want it to be that way, but I think it is that way, you're not gonna deal effectively with the environmental crisis unless you deal with the economic crisis at the same time. They're the same issues. And a lot of people who are, you know, environmental, boy, this factory is polluting, close it down. But what happens to the workers who are going out on the street? Not my concern, I'm concerned about the environment. This farm is using a pesticide, close it down. But what happens to what we have got to do is to understand the challenge, the real challenge is how do you have a social system and an economy 
which does at least two things. Number one, it provides decently for its people at the same time as it does not destroy the environment. That's what you've got to do. That's why national health care is an environmental issue, because that takes an enormous burden off the backs of working people. So the argument is either we have, and how many cities in America are faced with this dilemma? Mayors, you know, are faced with this dilemma. Here you have a factory which is polluting, it's poisoning its own workers, and the option is either you throw those workers out on the street or you save the environment. That is not a choice that we should have to make in 1991. If the choice is either jobs or the environment, that is no choice at all. What are your thoughts? Wow, that's, I mean, well, he's making the case basically for a Green New Deal. Intersectionality Mm -hmm. of both working class concerns and environmental concerns where you can just basically uh, create green jobs and ensure that the economy is still sustainable and that our uh, the way that we pr- produce waste and and uh, our our systems are sustainable for the environment so it's fascinating I mean he says in 1991 we shouldn't have to make that choice bro oh. we're still making that choice tenfold a million fold today yeah. uh, unfortunately yeah what oh God what if you'd been able to like go up to him at the time just whisper in his ear in, in 2019 the president isn't gonna believe that climate change is real yeah yeah, like I know. He would have lost it. Um, so before I get to complimenting him, which I want to do, uh, the Green New Deal is the Green New Deal, obviously, to reference the New Deal. Everybody gets that. There have been a lot of policies, though, over the past few decades that have had the New Deal like label applied to them in an effort to get people to support it. But there has never been a more appropriately named policy, I think, than the Green New Deal. Because in the same way that the New Deal was a foundation with many different arms or tentacles and many different policies, but had a core philosophical framework, the Green New Deal does too. And it is on firm scientific grounds, firm ideological grounds. It just makes sense. And I think that we are still in early days for people understanding it. Like he was trying to explain it back in 1991. I would say that if you talked to me 10 years ago, I wouldn't have spoken about climate change in a way that directly tied it to things like economic justice, like criminal justice, healthcare, those sorts of things. But I think that people like Bernie Sanders, who is still doing it, people like AOC, activists, you know, behind the Sunrise Movement, Greta, all of that. The way that they talk about this issue, I think, is going to fundamentally change not only the way that our government, our politicians deal with climate change, but virtually every other policy area. And it's a failing just of humans in general that we're siloing all of these very you know, these policy issues into concrete boxes, right? So that like we can't talk about them as if they don't affect all of the others. So environmental racism is an issue where uh, people of lower incomes, usually brown or black people, are disproportionately affected by the effects of climate change. And now that's two different, I guess, policy topics that are intertwined, but that's how things work. Mm -hmm. Uh, Everything is interconnected and we have some sort of problem with mainstream politicians. Mainstream politicians have this problem of like being unable to connect those. Bernie Sanders certainly does not have that issue and hasn't had that issue since uh, the 1990s and pre. Yeah, so by the way, I I went and I I wanted to find some other examples of Bernie Sanders from early on and I came across this C-SPAN video from 1991 of it was the uh, sorry the annual congressional dinner but it seemed very roasty the section that i read bernie sanders was up on like the the podium side or whatever and there was someone who spoke about him and they seemed i mean he was pretty new at that point they seemed very dismissive of bernie sanders that would be consistent for decades yes <laughs> um but anyway he got up and the you should understand the person who spoke before him made a joke about whether he would give up his parking spot or something i don't understand I was like a little kid at that point. I don't know what that was referenced to, but he gets up. He is not being brought up to talk about climate change or anything like that. So just bear that in mind as you watch this video again from 1991. When the United States Congress begins the process of breaking our dependency on the automobile, when we put billions of dollars into public transportation rather than to the highways and roads, when we mandate that automobiles get 60 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, all right. Yes, that's real research and development. 60 miles per gallon, when we have pollution-free transportation. When that happens, I am prepared, 
unequivocally to say before you, I will give up my space. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bernard, for those comments. <laughs> I always think it's so weird. It's just it's, rep for Bernard. Yeah, it's yeah. C-SPAN videos and Nina Turner call him Bernard. Yeah, uh, that's about it. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, and again, he was not brought up to talk about any of that stuff. The, the guy that you saw first in the video laughing, uh, the guy who looks like that documentarian but isn't, um, had just been joking about him, and he got up and he decided, no, I'm going to talk about infrastructure. I'm going to talk about the way we produce and consume energy. Even right there as a response to a roast, he tied together multiple different issue areas. He, he has one mode. I mean, he's unable to, to, to uh, snap out of it, and that's what makes him so special. And like, even, you know, we have other politicians who will like have fun, like AOC will do Desus and Moro or mm -hmm. whatever. She'll hang out with Chrissy Teigen. But, uh, but did she? I, I didn't see I that. I actually saw that on a Desus and Moro with oh. Anna Kendrick. They all had, she had like this amazing dinner with like all of these very, very fancy people and Including them, John Legend and, and Chrissy Teigen. I know, I know. You should have oh gone God. with like Groucho glasses and been a waiter <laughs> just so you could have been involved. Hey, uh, would you like some filet mignon? I love that even in the fantasy version of this, I'm at best serving them. Yes, exactly. I'm not well, invited. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like Groucho glasses so that I could sit at the table or anything. No, um, no, no. Yes. no, no Thank you're, you. You're actually uh, on your knees getting whipped cream poured into your mouth. Um, <laughs> That's a Yang thing, okay? Yang thing. <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, no, I, even even her, like she can have fun in those instances. Sorry for mm -hmm. that imagery. Um, but Bernie is just like, nope, this is Seriously. all I can talk about because this is, he, it's, he's yeah. obsessive in the best way. He's obsessed with making society more equitable. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I know that we're in this, this Democratic primary and, and this is beating a dead horse, but the people who say, Stop saying that these politicians, this one person has been right for literally decades. It doesn't matter. If you got to it a month ago, it's just as good as <laughs> it's not. It's really not. Someone who got it literally, like he, he is opposed to the 1%, and yet he was obviously in the top 1% for understanding and communicating about this issue. There are others now. But he was out there earlier than anyone else, better than anyone else, and that does actually matter, especially when you're talking about literally the most important issue facing our species and our civilization. We're gonna take a short break and we'll come back with more. Going into 2020, what do the voters actually care about? Whether it's Democrats or Republicans, you have things like impeachment and then you have a whole bunch of potential policies and issue areas. What do people really prioritize? I saw a really interesting analysis that I think we can learn a lot from the New York Times. And they start off saying, Republicans in Congress have tried to discredit the Democratic led impeachment inquiry by arguing that it distracts Congress from its real duties. You've probably heard this any number of different times. But when we look at data on revealed priorities from people all over the country, we see something different. Most people would give up their preferred outcomes on healthcare, the environment, or taxes if it meant getting their what they want on impeachment. It's an important issue for almost everyone. That I did not expect. So that it is not only something that people consider important, but in an experimental condition where they have to choose between these things, they will often defer to I want. Either if I oppose impeachment, I want him to stay in office. If I support it, I want him out of office more than my priorities in important issue areas. Among Democrats first, if they have an opinion on the topic, 86% support impeachment. That's pretty high. It's not the 95% approval rating the Republican Party Trump says he has, but it is pretty high. So we're gonna go into sort of the order of priorities. But initially, were you surprised by that? Among Democrats with an opinion of the topic, 86% support impeachment, the remainder don't. I mean that. I don't, I don't mean surprised by that. I mean the fact that they actually, like it is, it's, I think it's the number, we'll get into it, but I think it's the number two priority the number, for Democrats. I mean, no, I, I, it, I, partisanship takes two forms in people's minds. One, they think things should be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. In order to get, they, like the Nadler back in the day said, you know, I don't, I think bipartisan, sh, uh, or I think impeachment should proceed if it's bipartisan. That assumes that partisanship uh, dissolves once one side has made a clear case and the other side sees, sees that as having merit. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. I think this just reinforces partisanship existing in America as it actually does, which is like, I like my guy and I hate your guy. Mm -hmm. and. 
And but what is the nature of the disdain for Trump? It is that he doesn't care about the people in the country. And he doesn't care about the institutions of the country that we intellectually understand to make sense as written. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that, if you're trying to then ask people like, what do you want, healthcare? Do you want healthcare to proceed? They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But it will be more likely if this guy was out of the way because mm -hmm. he is exactly what's clogging up the veins of justice. So, so let's focus on that as a priority. It's like a strategic and prioritization. Yeah. Yeah, rather than a like, I'm floating in the ether having to choose between like getting him out and healthcare. And that's backed Maybe. up by everything because it's something tangible and real and, and a fight mm -hmm. that people get. Yeah. And it has a face to it. Yeah. Like healthcare doesn't have a face, it has every face. It has our face. It's effective yeah, when you can show a specific face that went through a specific, the, the argument for healthcare reform is more effective when you can show this person got cancer and died and had no way of knowing it because X, Y, and Z because they couldn't afford healthcare. Yeah. Those things work, but it's it's harder to come by those and harder to get everybody to understand and empathize with it in a real way than tied to policy. Come on, that's a mm -hmm. tough uphill battle. But saying, do you wanna get this guy out of office because he's clogging up the veins and ruining America? The answer is, yeah, that thing. That seems reasonable. You should do more politics talk. You know what? You get some things. You should. Show me your charts. Dude. Okay, let's go to a chart. Um, if you are on anything less than a big screen TV, apologies in advance. This is not gonna, I'm gonna talk it through with you, but it's gonna be tiny. If you're on a phone, I mean, come on, forget about it. Anyway, uh, so there you go. Now, you go, it's on the New York Times. You can find it if you want to. But anyway, what you're seeing there is uh, from left to right, the percent who agree on a thing. So the farther to a right a dot is, that's the more people, that, these are Democrats, agree on this policy. The higher you go uh, from the bottom to the top is how uh, high of a priority it is. So the uh, importance of it. So if something is in the top, is right mm, mm, there, then it is both something that we agree on and we think is super important. If it's way down, I'm having a try. If it's in the bottom left, we don't prioritize it and we don't agree that it should be a priority. So let's talk about some things that are in that really important top right section. So the, I said it was a number two priority to impeach Trump. Literally the only thing that is both agreed on more and is rated as a higher priority is, and this is actually sort of heartwarming, I guess. It shouldn't be controversial, but don't separate immigrant children. That is literally the only thing the Democrats prioritize more than impeaching Donald Trump. And I'm gonna say because of Trump, actually, he seems to be a pretty important part of it. But anyway, that's right up there. Now, very close to it, you have things like no ban on abortion, don't build a wall, dream or path to citizenship, no ban on Muslim immigrants, no mass deportation. So that cluster is almost totally immigration related concerns that are reactive to the policies of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I'm glad that they're prioritizing those sorts of things. They're also very, like, that's what's so frustrating, is so, they're very obvious. They're yeah, so that's why the percent good. agreement is so high. It's because it's not controversial. And it's so bad. What's that? Like all these things yeah. are so bad. Like <laughs> it's an issue that we like when people come across the border. We had made a decision that we would separate a family. Mm -hmm. We don't even separate families on the sign saying that people are crossing here. <laughs> it's a family together. Like because we know they're supposed that they're, to be together. Because they're coming here. Just help their families. The, mm -hmm. the sign that you have to memorize when you take a driver's test in California is a whole group of, is a whole family trying to get across the border because we together. all get it. They're coming here together for a better life because we're so dope. Yes. Right? <laughs> or whatever you want to believe, sticker. right? Yes. But like, we're separating them. Yeah. And every Democrat understands that that is important and we agree. Mm -hmm. And that's good, and 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 that's probably why it relate. And they're so related, brand wise, to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Like they are make these arguments with like the economy. People kind of hold the president responsible for the successes and failures as a concept. But like Donald Trump is out there every day, putting his face on separating children at the border, building a wall so that eventually, if even they do get over, we'll separate them. But like the, they're evil. Stop them in the first these place. These people are evil. We need a wall. Like they're invaders of the walk the dead from the north, like um, all that stuff, ban on Muslim immigrants, it's all Trump stuff. Now this not only is um, a referendum on Trump's effectiveness to brand himself mm -hmm. and communicate his stuff, which he is, it also is like, uh, our messaging should probably be around that. 
if that's a thing that clearly is firing people up. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that it, it will be. It definitely was in the midterms. Um, Another we'll challenge see. is to get things that are important, like uh, you know, abortion waiting periods, guns bans, um, reducing the size of the military, and oil and gas drilling to get them to be as easy to understand as don't separate immigrant children because yeah. they are important. People just don't agree that they're important. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why, and so you, because you really of how landed on, um, we're gonna go just a couple minutes over. You, you really landed on, there There were two reasons that I, that I wanted to cover this, and especially right on the cusp of 2020. One is so that you'll understand what's likely to happen in 2020. The other is for those of you who, like that politics is not a thing that you just wanna stay up on, but that you care deeply about and you, you feel like on a day to day basis, it is a thing that you are engaged in. Like you need to understand what people are already prioritize. And if the things you care about are in this left bottom corner, then there's work ahead of us. Yeah. This is the things we need to prioritize because people either don't agree on it, don't understand it, or don't prioritize it. So it's on all of us, whether you're, you know, broadcasting a show or you know, talking on social media, talking with people in your life, these these are the things that you need to prioritize because so far people aren't really getting it. Mm-hmm. Now, really fast, I want to jump to. Um, oh, I just want to briefly mention uh, a couple of the articles talking about this are like, oh, Green New Deal. Everybody says so popular. It's like the twenty fifth priority. Okay, sort of, but there's a big cluster in the middle there, and big environmental program is prioritized more. So people do still care about it. Um, this is a, a, a difficult thing that that lumps a lot of stuff together. So anyway, just bear that in mind. I do want to jump really fast though to. Uh, Impeachment is not just important for Democrats. Impeachment outweighs every other issue for Republicans, including parts of Mr. Trump's and the party's agenda, such as building a border wall. For the Democrats, it was number two after don't separate families. For the Republicans, it's number one and it's not even close. If we go to this chart, you're gonna see it is way above don't ban guns. So hypothetically, they, you, you believe that you have to take the gun from their cold dead hands, they'll give it to you, but don't take Trump from their alive hands, I guess. Yep. Yeah, so they really care about it too. And um, you know, the, That's the thing our is- calmer than you are, dude, approach, calmer than you are. Mm-hmm. You guys seem to be really, like, the worked reason up. that you're so worked up about don't impeach Trump is because you know that there's something wrong with him. You yeah. know that there's something wrong with him, and, you, and, no, and, and so do the people defending him on all these impeachment hearings because they never deny that there's something wrong with him. They're just denying, they're like yelling at the refs that they aren't calling all the fouls. Yeah, it's procedural or it's diversionary, yeah. Um, But we can learn a little bit from some of the other uh, spots here too. Uh, What's interesting is uh, uh, up there in like third, the second, third and fourth place, um, don't ban guns, build a wall, and don't give reparations for slavery. Which is like even low on the like Democrat. Like it was mm-hmm. what, like 20% of Democrats yeah. found it important. Yeah, and the thing is, like, I, I get that we've gone over this and it's pointless because I'm not gonna convince anybody. But if, but if you believe that the support for Trump, it's just, it's economic anxiety, it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's racial concerns, immigration concerns, gun concerns, and they're still thinking a lot about slavery and how much they don't want any sort of justice for that dark legacy. Um, so anyway, you got that. Also, I noticed, not that it matters because they won't do anything about it, but um, the thing that the uh, Republicans agree the most on, universal gun background checks. They don't prioritize it, and if you're a Republican politician, you damn sure don't prioritize it. But they do agree more on that than on literally everything else. And um, you know, you can you can find these charts because there's a ton of things on there. There's a lot to be learned there. But going into 2020, especially as this Democratic uh, presidential uh, primary continues, Here's what is on people's minds, and impeachment is very much one of those things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Brett. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, lots more to get to. The media has been incredibly slow to learn, glacial really, how they should proceed in the Trump years. How is he using them, getting free coverage and using them to amplify misinformation? Uh, Super slow to learn, but apparently they have learned at least a little bit. And this is coming from a study by uh, Media Matters that has looked into a number of different prominent political Twitter accounts, including like the AP, Reuters, CNN, Politico, The Hill, you know, the normal ones you'd expect. Are they amplifying Trump misinformation or are they making sure that people that see their tweets 
understand what the truth is. Uh, they looked at over 2000 tweets, 32 different Twitter feeds, and this is what they learned. So 50% of the time, the outlet's Twitter accounts disputed misinformation. This is an improvement from when they first conducted this study when uh, they only did so 35% of the time. So still, only half the time do they actually make clear that someone seeing, for instance, a Trump quote in a tweet would know going out of that that it wasn't actually true. But that is improvement, so yay. Yay. <laughs> that's good, they're doing better. Yay. Um, so that's good. That's uh, on great average, for something that's supposed to be like fact based, it's great. Exactly. Yeah, yay. If you run a media outlet, I think your greatest fear should be like there's a couple different fears you should have. One is totally missing stories that are super important. Okay. And the other is that people leave your coverage knowing less than they did going in or believing less true things than they did going in. So let's give you some more information. On average, outlets amplified false or misleading claims without disputing them 15 times a day. <sighs> a dec- ah, wow, a decline of 21% from our first study when they promoted Trump misinformation on average of 19 times per day. So here's what's really interesting. So normally I produce these stories. This was produced by our producer Angel. Uh-huh. And so I was going to anecdotally state what they apparently have factually. So. The Hills Twitter account produced the most passive misinformation of any feed we reviewed, accounting for nearly half of the total tweets that pushed Trump and misinformation without disputing it, wow. up from 43% of the total in the first study. So getting worse. Now look, The Hill has some great elements to it. And like would you write for this? And I think I was talking about like video, but also <laughs> thank you for publishing my editorials. But their Twitter account like is nightmare fuel. Literally every day I see tweets that are just a quote from Trump. It's a lie. And it's just the quote from Trump. Right. And you can click on the article and maybe somewhere in the article it's corrected. But if you're just absorbing that on Twitter, you will believe the lie. Or you'll believe at least that the fact that the president said it makes it seem at least semi credible. The fact that a, a news outlet is repeating it makes it seem credible. And if they're not correcting it, especially in a time where more outlets are going out of their way to do it, then it seems like it didn't need to be corrected. And yet many of them still make this mistake. And I think that at least on Twitter, the hill might actually be the worst. So it's kind of like how often media being also a business comes, Mm -hmm. like the business aspect of it becomes more powerful than the actual like gatekeepers of information part of it is. And it's kind of, you know how like the problem when it comes to like television is sometimes the desire to be first because of the attention that brings you becomes a huge failure. And it may be getting stronger that effect. This desire to be retweeted the most or um, have the most followers or gain more followers, that becomes harmful. Yeah. Because everyone's kind of in this race to get more attention, to go viral. And then they do stuff like, listen, we know this is wrong. We know this is absolutely absurd, but it's people are gonna. But we don't wanna die. We don't wanna be canceled. I know. Uh, Brooke had a tweet go super viral, and I have lost all my ethics in my Twitter. I'm just trying uh, to catch up to her now, <laughs> and I just I want that. Catch up. No, 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 I'm just kidding. No, you're literally right. <laughs> I don't care how long I'm on Twitter. I'm never gonna have a tweet do as I well as that one. But anyway, happened, but thank you. Follow um, me on Twitter. <laughs> exactly. And uh, and by the way, so there we have a graphic folks on the hill again. This is not just a problem of the Hill, it's a problem of all media. And right. the Hill does have, like a lot of their articles are perfectly fine. The video content, yeah. perfectly fine. But you don't but get their Twitter, 48%. Exactly, of, yeah. their, their Twitter needs some help. But anyway, let's go a little bit more into the study. While most of the news outlet Twitter feeds we studied improved from our first study to our second, some saw the rates of disputing Trump's uh, falsehoods decline. The Washington Post main feed, which had disputed 89% of false Trump claims in the first study, did so only 58% of the time in our second. CNN also dropped from 75% down to 60. So again, look, they did. They looked at thousands of tweets, and so large enough numbers, it should throw off natural variability. It is still possible that there, there, there is some of that in this. But you're seeing large drops from some of the I would say most trusted news outlets. Like if the Washington, like people trust the Washington Post, don't trust their op eds, they're crazy. But for the news coverage, it's generally perfectly fine. If they're no longer seeing themselves as needing to provide that sort of fact checking role, that's damaging. And it might contribute to an environment in which other less noteworthy or less well funded outlets also feel like, well, I guess that's not a thing that we're all really doing. It's not financially incentivized by potential readers. Exactly. Yeah. So look, this is this is really concerning because we are clearly at this point not going to get Trump to stop lying. There's no amount of shaming or fact checking you can do that will actually modify his behavior. So there needs we to be a try, firewall. We will try. <laughs> we'll still correct as much right, as we can. Right. But that's what I'm saying. We can't stop him 
from lying necessarily, right. feel free. But we can provide a firewall between his misinformation and the public. And we, we're not gonna stop it from getting everyone. Dude's got dozens of millions of Twitter followers. But for every person we can make sure does not leave a news cycle believing demonstrable um, untruths, that's a good thing. And that's, I think, an important part of the media going forward, whether you're as big as the Washington Post or as small as whoever. And that's the thing, like that. I'm not even trying to put that on like a, a news organization. Like it's not a news organization's job to encourage the president to stop lying. It's mm -hmm. just your job to focus on the facts. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And to show improvement over time. And and by the way, so I, I alluded to overall how is the media adapting to the Trump years? This is a very small part of it. And and there there has been some improvement. You've you've seen it in this study. CNN's doing their like live fact checking on like lower thirds. Uh -huh. That's good. Those aren't the worst things that the media can do. I mean, we remember in 2016 the just uh, live playing the Trump rallies and stuff, effectively giving him billions of dollars in free campaign advertisements. That is probably more damaging during the election. And there is good news there. We've previously talked about it. Fox News is still playing a lot of his rallies live, but MSNBC and CNN are doing it only a very small amount. And while I don't spend a lot of time watching those outlets, if you do, please encourage them. They have to, if they do the right thing, they need to be encouraged yeah. to continue doing it. And so the, the stakes could not be higher in this election. So hopefully we'll see them continuing to learn and adapt over time. Okay, we're gonna take a short break, come back more after this. There are a few issues in the Democratic primary being discussed as in great length as healthcare. And there are very different policies that different candidates are pushing forward. So should we have a strong, real Medicare for all system or should we largely sustain the Affordable Care Act? Maybe strengthen it in some ways, protect it from assaults from Republicans. That is often pitched as an ideological difference, that there are these progressives who want one thing, there are more centrists who want the other. But I do want to remind everyone of what is actually at stake here. Because the idea that if we were to just maintain the status quo, hey, how bad could that actually be? That may make sense for people who are incredibly wealthy, have access to all the health care they could ever want. But for regular people, the situation isn't necessarily just bad. In some ways, it's actually getting worse. So I want to show you some survey data that was released recently by Gallup about people who, because of the high cost of health care, are putting off seriously needed medical treatments. So take a look at this here. They tweeted out that 25% of Americans say that one of their family members have put off treatment for a serious medical condition due to cost in the last 12 months. And what you're seeing there is historic data stretching all the way back to 2001. And so right there you have 22% that's actually 25% for a serious condition. Fully one third of all respondents say someone in their family has put off some sort of medical treatment because they could not afford to do something about it. And that number has been steadily creeping up. It was about half the level it is now back in 2001. So that's after, that's like a decade after the ACA. And think about that. Think about someone being in a position where they have a serious medical need, it needs treatment. But they can't do anything about it because they can't afford to actually go. For many people, that will mean that when they eventually do have something done about it, the cost will be more extreme, the debt will be more extreme because the condition will have been allowed to proceed. For some people though, it will mean that they die. They die because they had an untreated illness and they died because it was too expensive. Another 8% said that they or a family member put off a treatment for a less serious condition. And so we're seeing across the board, many, many people are seeing this, which should be unheard of in literally the richest country that has ever existed. But anyway, let's talk about some of the other costs there and some of the other things that are resulting from this. So when a person can't afford to go, when they have to put off this sort of treatment, do we think that they're necessarily going to find themselves in better economic condition later on? Not necessarily, and there is a solution, but it's not one that we should be encouraging. According to the American Health Association, patient visits to emergency departments and community hospitals increased 19% over the last two decades and have likely climbed to 20% or higher by today. So that means that in the end, it's going to be more costly. Again, their condition will have advanced to a more severe state at that point. 
And from an economic perspective, delayed care can have a range of negative effects, including reduced workplace productivity in the short term and increased health care costs in the long term, costs that ultimately burden the federal budget, which has ripple effects on the economy. So when we talk about medical cost in this country, it has the obvious effect that's happening right now that people are not getting the care that they actually need. That is horrific healthcare outcomes for them. But economically, both for the individual families and also for the country at large, this is literally the worst way to run a healthcare industry. And so when we talk about the potential costs of something like Medicare for all, and it's always pitched as some objective cost, not in any way related to what we're already spending, it will be pitched in a way to scare you off. But think about the cost, both in dollars and in human lives from the current system. And so as this primary proceeds and as you see people with their competing ideas, this is the true cost. Okay, thank you everybody, enjoy your Christmas Eve, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.